Welcome to Chapter 9 videos. Today we're going to be discussing 9.1 quadratic graphs and their properties. We actually looked at quadratics a little bit last chapter when we were learning how to factor. So we're going to continue and build off of that knowledge. Our goal for this lesson is that we can graph functions of the form y equals a x squared and y equals a x squared plus c. So let's first discuss what a quadratic function is. It is a function that can be written in the form y equals a x squared plus bx plus c. And a cannot e be equal to zero. This is called standard form of a quadratic function, and I believe that we have talked about this briefly before. Standard form means that it's in the form ax squared plus bx plus c, and you'll notice that the a, b, c are going in order just like the alphabet. Here are some examples that you will see y equals 3x squared, y equals x squared plus 9, and y equals x squared minus x minus 2. So there are many different uh, formats that the quadratics can appear, but the basic form is the standard form that we have talked about. So now, the quadratic parent function is y equals x squared. Just like your mom or dad is the leader of your family, this equation is the leader of all quadratics. This is the parent function, so it's the most basic form of a quadratic function, y equals x squared. And you'll see a picture on your note sheet. It's on my PowerPoint as well on the left side. The parent function is always based at 0, 0. That's called the vertex. You'll see more about that later. Um, and the graph of this quadratic function is a U-shaped curve um, called a parabola. So make sure you jot those details down. Parabola is a very important word in this chapter. So now let's talk about what an axis of symmetry is, because we'll be looking at these a lot. An axis of symmetry is the fold or line that divides the parabola into two matching halves. So that means if you were to fold the parabola on this axis, you would fit onto the other half of the parabola on the other side of the graph. The highest or lowest point of a parabola is its vertex. So you'll see <clears throat> in the graphs at right, right here, that would be a vertex. Um, and also here, that would be a vertex. And something to note is that the vertex is always on the axis of symmetry. So when you find that place where you can fold and match, it's kind of like a mirror, um, you know that at the very tip, at the bottom or top, is the vertex. So now, if the parabola opens upward, such as in the first picture, the vertex is called a minimum because it is the lowest point of that graph. Now conversely, if the parabola opens downward, such as the bottom right corner graph, the vertex is the maximum because it is the highest point of that graph. So make sure you have all those details down and now we will take a look at our first couple examples. What are the coordinates of the vertex of each graph? Is it a minimum or a maximum? In part A, we have a parabola opening down. The vertex is the point 0, 3. And because it is opening down, that vertex is the highest point, so it is called a maximum. Hopefully this is intuitive to you. Um, highest point, biggest, number, maximum. So I'll just put highest point in parentheses. Now let's take a look at a different situation. We have a parabola opening upwards. The vertex is the lowest point this time. And the coordinate would be 1, comma, negative 1 for the vertex, and this is called a minimum. Example 2. Let's learn how to graph a function, specifically the function y equals 1 third x squared. We need to make a table of values in the problems to assist us with graphing, and we need to figure out what the domain and range are. So first of all, Think to yourself, what numbers would work well with dividing by 3? When I think about that, I think of the numbers 0, 3, and 6. Because when you plug them in, 
it'll work out nicely. So one third and then zero squared. So this x value is just going in right there, just to remind you. So remember, when you multiply by zero, zero is the answer. So it's a nice beginning point, zero, zero. Next one, let's plug in the three. Three squared is nine. Nine over three equals three. So the next coordinate is three, three. Last one, one third times six squared, one third. So the three is on the bottom, the 36 is on top, and that would be 12. Six comma 12. So let's graph, graph those. Um, zero, zero, three, three. It looks like on mine I went up by three, so I'll continue to do that. Three, six, nine, twelve. Three, six, nine, twelve. Okay. Three, three, and six, twelve. And the vertex is zero, zero. So the axis of symmetry is going to be on that y-axis. So we can actually find out the other half of the graph by just reflecting it. So the next point would be right here, and then the next point would be this point. So hopefully you can see, visually figure out how to do that. If you're, you're stuck, you basically just go to the y-axis and count out how many units that next point is from the axis. So... That's how I figure out those points. So yes, we reflected the points from the table over the axis of symmetry x equals zero to find more points on the graph. Now, domain and range. Domain are the x values on the graph, and range are the y values. This is a very common concept that you will use in various math classes in high school and beyond. Domain. The x values, well, if you continue the graph on, see how there's arrows at the end, the domain is all real numbers. Every single number works for this function. And I can't spell numbers. All real numbers. Okay. Ranges. Range values. Okay. The range values are the y values. Well, where do the y values start? They start at zero. You can see that there's no negative y values at all. And the reason why is because we're squaring the value. So when you square a value that's negative, it becomes positive. So the range value is going to be y is greater than or equal to zero. And that means all real numbers greater than or equal to zero. Now let's talk about the coefficient of the x squared term. In the last example, the coefficient was one third. Well, did you know that the coefficient of the x squared term affects the width of a parabola as well as the direction in which it opens? So now let's talk about the different possibilities for coefficients. Make sure you have your blanks for this. If the coefficient is positive, then the parabola opens up. If the coefficient is negative, the parabola opens down. And now, depending on the number in front, if we have these examples right here, and this is on your note sheet, you don't need to fill this in, just watch. Because 3 is greater than 1 half and 1 is greater than 1 half, the parabola with the 1 half as a leading coefficient is the widest. Now think of slope, a concept that we talked about several chapters ago, and steepness. Slope is the rate of change. So if it's a fractional slope, it goes up slower. Whereas if it's a whole number slope, it's going to go up faster. The same thing applies. When we have a fraction um, in front of the coefficient, it's going to be wider, like this. Whereas for these ones, it's going to be going up steeper. So you'll see in the next example what I'm talking about. 
Use the graphs below. What is the order from widest to narrowest of the graphs of the quadratic functions f of x equals negative 4x squared, f of x equals 1, 1 fourth x squared, and f of x equals x squared? What we want to do is, first of all, take the absolute value of all coefficients. We have a negative 4, so we're going to take that and make it 4. We have a 1 fourth, and we have a 1. So what you want to do is list the coefficients from smallest to biggest. This will help you list the functions from widest to narrowest. The smaller the coefficient, the wider the graph is. So now let's list them. We're going to have 1 fourth. That was a lovely one fourth. One fourth, comma one, comma four. Huh. Okay, let's see if it'll let me write four. So now, widest to narrowest. First of all, we have the one-fourth function, one-fourth x squared. And when you rewrite the functions, you want to go back to the original form. The next one's going to be f of x equals one x squared. The one in front doesn't have to be there. I'm just putting there to help you. And then the last one is f of x equals negative four x squared. Remember, the sign in front just deals with if it's opening up or down. The size of the number is what determines if it's wide or narrow. So there is example three. Feel free to ask me questions about that when we're together in class if you're confused. So now let's talk about the c value. The value of c in y equals ax squared plus c translates the graph up or down. Translates means shift up or down. So as you can see here, we have a negative 3, and this is in your notes, a negative 3 means 3 units down. And a plus 3 means 3 units up. And you will definitely be doing all of this in Algebra 2, so it's a good thing you're looking at it now. Let's take a whack at example 4. How is the graph of y equals 2x squared plus 3 different from the graph y equals 2x squared? Well, since we don't have the graphs, we should graph them for sure. Let's choose small numbers such as negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2, and let's just plug them in. It looks like I color-coded, so I'm going to do the same here. We'll make this purple. Okay. So plug in the negative 2, and we get 2 times negative 2 squared. That means 2 times 4, which equals 8. And then plug in the negative 1. So there we have some points. We might as well graph that now on the coordinate plane given. So I want to buy twos on the y-axis to save some space. 10 and 12. Okay, negative 2, 8. Negative 1, 2, 0, 0. 1, 2, and 2, 8. Connect those points. Now let's do the next function. Plug in and add 3. So this is the easier part. You just have to do plus 3 to each value. So 11, 5, 3, 5, 11. Because the difference between these two functions is just the plus 3. So that means right here. and connect.
Okay, there you have it. We have two parabolas. The graph of y equals 2x squared plus 3 has the same shape as the graph of y equals 2x squared, but is shifted up 3 units. So that would be option A. So it's important to note when the only difference between two quadratics is that number at the end, that means that they have the same shape but different um, places on the graph. So one's shifted up or down. Okay, we're almost done. Thanks for sticking with me. Example five, here's an application problem. Um, an acorn drops from a tree branch 20 feet above the ground. The function h equals negative 16 t squared plus 20 gives the height h of the acorn in feet after t seconds. What is the graph of this quadratic function? At about what time does the acorn hit the ground? Okay, so first we want to pick some t values, and I actually have them on my PowerPoint. You can take a look at them now and fill in your t column on your table. I chose values 0, 0 0.5, 1, and 1.5. So now we want to plug in <clears throat> these values for the function. This first one, we just get 20. Next we get 16. And I'm assuming you can do this in your calculator. We get 4, and then we get... negative 16. So just to make sure you are realizing what's happening, t is for time in seconds and h is the height of the acorn in feet. So you can take a look at this table, you notice that we get into the negatives, that means that the acorn hit the ground between those two times. So now let's graph these and label the axes. We have time in seconds on the bottom and height in feet on the y-axis. Let's go by our t values and let's also go by 5, 10, 15, 20. Now let's plot these points. and connect. So the question is, when does the acorn hit the ground? The acorn hits the ground when its height above ground is zero feet. That should logically make sense to you. That is the ground's height is zero feet. Usually we base our height off of from the ground to wherever we are. The acorn hits the ground slightly after uh, more than one second. So the acorn hits the ground after slightly more than one second. And that completes this example. We have the graph and we have when a, an approximation the acorn hits the ground. Okay. Here is the lesson check problems. You can feel free to start these now or wait until we do problems like this together during class. Also, I encourage you to write down any questions you have from this lesson and we will discuss them when we meet next.